Well, perhaps this recording is going to be breaking the law in some respect because I'm going to be criticizing and talking quite harshly about the South African Human Rights Commission. And I've just, I would almost like to say, wasted 40 minutes of my life listening to uh, a press briefing that the commission was conducting. Uh, it ended. Uh, uh, there was a, an interrupted sort of line of communication from some psychologist and they were talking about an upcoming summit uh, to discuss cohesion and uh, social cohesion and non-racialism. Um, I, you know, the, the psychologist was saying all the buzzwords all the fancy buzzwords, all the loose, stupid, associative rationalization that you get with these kinds of very morally inept commissars. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's very interesting how they give explanation for things that are just merely statistical correlations at the end of the day. How they just loosely associate these certain things as if the one leads to the other, as if they're proving something like legal causation. And then so then their narrative is therefore beyond reproach, is therefore taken for granted, as it were, as they spew their disgusting blanket generalizations and, quite frankly, racialist ideology uh, of racial consciousness that is completely assumed as, as, as a fundamental premise in the construction of these narratives. So you have the South African Commission for Human Rights quite ironically uh, being the, the, the source of what I would call is this toxic form of racial consciousness while saying the, you know, the, the lip service of, of talking about non-racialism you know it's as if it is inconceivable it's just impossible that some people maybe don't make friends with one another not because of racial divides but because of individual and personal culture you could say as well but i mean in the in the sense that people as individuals have a certain uh, profile, have a certain um, temperament, uh, as if these can't be considerations. Uh, that, 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 that if you give people the crutch to, to lean into and the, and the crutch to use as well, the reason why things aren't going my way, the reason why I don't arrive at my desired outcome or destination is because I can play the race card as if that isn't essentially a perverse incentive that makes it essentially almost completely impossible to have any kind of non-racialist exchange and negotiation uh, uh, between individuals, you know, th th that inhabit a space or something like that. I mean, I, I can almost... I can just imagine the horror stories of of their sensitivity training and, and their diversity coaching or, or whatever they, they call it. I would really like to see their materials. I, I would love to see how they package what is no doubt going to be essentially a form of enforced sympathy extraction between groups of racial consciousness and lived experiences that, I mean, this psychologist... Uh, was saying all the all the disgusting buzzwords they just completely dehumanize people and completely canonize their essence into some grouped identity again making you know the these these embarrassing statistical correlations um and and then saying that that these descriptions of, of statistical correlation are the explanatory, um, you can't, you can't have an authentic or genuine non-racialism 
when you're going to be prone to such generalizations, to such blanket accusations against society. There are members of the commission who said, we live in a racist society. I mean, really, you make a concession like that, you know, I mean, you use too many of these buzzwords, and you're in the race and gender studies ideology uh, um, circus. You, you, you have already depleted any kind of normative ethical basis in which you could even have people that could confront one another in an authentic way. It just becomes absolutely impossible. Uh, because because your framework has just decontextualized non-racialism into a form in which it, it no longer becomes non-racialism. Essentially, then non-racialism just becomes another uh, another instrument in the arsenal of this so-called anti-racist, which is a blatantly racist ideology. And and this is why we have this incurable problem at the moment is because. Uh, the, the normative ethical foundation of the new South Africa has been betrayed and undermined. And it's undermined by, it's not just undermined by Julius Malema, it's undermined by Cyril Ramaphosa, it's undermined by, by the president himself, who uses, who abuses the phrase uh, or the term non-racialism um, in almost a worse way, because at least Julius Malema is more flagrant about his black fascism in some sense, whereas uh, in some ways Sul Ramaphosa just kind of provides a kind of a, a, the intellectual, or should I say pseudo-intellectual sentiments that allow that kind of reaction of Julius Malema to be somewhat justified or at least uh, uh, given this kind of, the solemn nod that, you know, oh yes, there, there are things that need to be uh, uh, investigated and looked at. And the standards that are being used are impossible to do anything other than confirm the narrative of that we live in a systemically oppressive, racist society. And as soon as you start saying that societies are racist, I mean, really, you've completely lost the plot. Now you're not talking about morality. You're talking about something else. And what they are talking about is, is, a, is a real corruption of, of the Constitution itself, because they'll say that they're, well, they're talking about social justice. So yes, we can say that we live in a racist society, because... Uh, uh, the, somehow the, the the phrase social justice appears in the constitution, but it has been reinterpreted by this anti-racist ideology. Social justice actually means justice for the individual against the collective, relative to the collective versus the individual, not groups versus groups, not groups in contradistinction to other groups and some kind of disgusting racialist consciousness because the constitution is supposed to be a non-racialist document. But it's not read in a non-racialist way. It's read in a way that first comes from racial consciousness and says, oh, well, we want to arrive at the outcome of non-racialism. And so that end will justify the means of any racialism that we wish to invoke and the and the and the reactionary chauvinism that will help balance the scales or some bullshit like that. And when you've already kind of got that kind of identitarian war as the cultural norm, which has been culturally normalized by people of the ANC, uh, by top top ranking members of the ANC that have set the tone of this new politics of this fascistic politics, that is completely infused with an obsession with identitarian racialistic you know uh, attributes and 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 statistical correlations when you are going to send in psychologists with this kind of criteria uh, it's impossible i mean you've already killed non-racialism yourself there's no way that you're going you're going to get people to sympathize with each other's groups so that they are forced to give each other equal treatment based on their group belonging 
I mean, it's disgusting. Uh, that's not non-racialism. Non-racialism is that some people are your friends and some people are not your friends because you don't like them. People don't like other people sometimes. I mean, you know, there is something to... Um, let's say, giving people the, um, the latitude, uh, uh, to, to sort of, to, to be exposed, uh, enough to know if, if you would like that person or not, or something like that. Uh, but sadly, with the, with the kind of acute identitarian consciousness, which is almost, demanded of the people who talk about things like societies being racist endemically that you live in a racist society and therefore there has to be some kind of comp compensant compensatory sympathy that is awarded in, in in quite a prejudiced way in quite a bigoted way in some sense but it just is, is supposedly it's a kind of it's a positive bigotry that, that, that you must just sort of give an extra credence to someone because their their voices are diminished and their lived experience is is of a or is of a quality that requires some kind of bolstering some kind of artificial limelight that must be shone in their direction well as soon as you give people those kinds of instruments and you say that this is what needs to happen in order to have a non-racialist society i mean it, it's it's disgusting it's disingenuous the whole thing is is just a, a shambles i mean you you have uh, morally undermined the thing that you're i mean what you are doing is you're trying to make people uh, uh play some kind of narrative out some kind of formula some kind of moral picture they have to kind of inhabit this moral picture and they just have to arrive at the outcome and it doesn't matter the procedure that they took to arrive at the outcome it doesn't it just it just cares about the superficial outcome of how it looks you know and it doesn't give a damn about the procedure and the authenticity of how it's arrived at and uh it's this kind of politicization of identity and and and, and race um, that really makes uh, non-racialism impossible. And to a large extent, uh, this is the fault of journalism. This is the fault of, I mean, I, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to be honest that I, I don't know exactly the kind of sensitivity and diversity training um, that the commission uh, recommends or that it uh, uh, endorses. But um, just going off of the tenor of, of what I have already heard from one of their psychologists and the kinds of loose buzzwords that are used, the kind of ideologically toxic infused narratives that are already being employed uh, and, and invoked. Uh, you know, this is why we have uh, a failed New South Africa. I mean, it's hard just to blame the commission. I mean, in some sense, the commission is, is a, a symptom of a, of a broader sickness um, which, you know, obviously, you know, you know, if, if you want to understand this, it's essentially because without divisive racial politics, the ANC really doesn't have a, uh, any sort of cover for its kind of abject failure of, uh, of a tenure, you know, th that ANC rule has been essentially disastrous and, instead of uh, being made politically accountable or being held politically accountable, instead uh, it has invoked a narrative of uh, racializing politics and racializing morality in order to create a narrative that sort of um, insulates political elites, uh, essentially and that creates uh, 
quite a pernicious form of, I mean, I, I put it in my other recordings, um, you know, the kind of the false consciousness which produces, you know, scapegoating and witch hunts, of which this whole scenario is essentially one of these witch hunts, which is required in order to fuel this um, uh, sort of very depressing outgrowth. You know, it it, uh, it reeks of, you know, the sort of I mean, it, it, it's not that hard to imagine that in the future, uh, the South African Human Rights Commission is going to be leaned on and is, is going to eventually sort of turn into the show trials of, of the USSR or something like that, of, of the Stalinist show trials, of that kind of ideological instrument of enforcing uh, qu quite a disgusting dressing down and reinterpretation of the constitution as essentially um real normative morale i mean that's what the that's what something like the south african human rights commission should be doing is is it should be getting into the issue of normative morality and explaining why non-racialism um has been betrayed you know uh, all across the country. I mean, even the DA, until very recently, until their, their latest federal conference, you know, un under their old leadership of Musi Maimane, was on this bandwagon of essentially corrupting the notion of non-racialism into... Uh, is, without normative morality... Um, you just you don't have a hope of of having a common humanity of, of uh, my last recording sort of uh, goes into this issue and talks about why uh culture has deflated how essentially we live now in a cultural wasteland because you can't even have an effect of art and and media um you, you can't have artful entertainment because there's You can't produce a, a universal theme. There's no, there's no more common standard of righteousness and correctness. Everything to do with morality has been pluralized and, and, and sort of uh, relativistically compartmentalized into... Um, racial and identitarian boxes essentially and under that there is only the formula of oppressed and, and 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 oppressor and so essentially all art just has to kind of be sending out these two signals to oppressed and oppressor and because there's no universal theme you can't even tell very complex narratives anymore. But anyway, I, I go into this in my other recording. I'm not going to repeat all this. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I, maybe I maybe I can try and make myself a part of the summit if they have submissions from from uh, the general public. Um, But I mean, if, if you want to understand why racialism and racial consciousness is stopping social cohesion and non-racialism, you merely have to look at the Chief Justice himself when he is uh, uh, treating the public protector to a special kind of infantilism, which is so disgusting. You know, so the, 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 the public protector uh, says that she took advice from some other lawyers and so she just followed that advice and and that you know it, it can't be her fault that the advice was defective or, or, or that the recommendations that she was following on the advice of other lawyers um led to some untoward consequence it, it's not her responsibility it's the responsibility of of the people that that proffered uh the advice to her 
I mean, this is disgusting. I mean, this is the public protector uh, who, who forms an important administrative function within the new South Africa uh, that has a very high office, and that, that office requires legal expertise. And everything that is done in the name of the office of the public protector, it has to be done with the backing of the office holder. And it has to be properly, even if, it, if she didn't originate the legal theory or the legal strategy that the office is going to be um, deploying, everything that the public protector does is important because it, it sets down important precedent. And if she isn't going to be there underwriting her own decisions to follow advice or not, if she isn't going to put her own integrity uh, uh, and uh, behind the actions that the office takes, then what is she doing? Then she's not the public protector if, if she can't be held responsible uh, for, for the advice that she follows. That, that's, that's the whole function of, of the public protector is, is to act uh, in a way befitting the public protector. And, and if she can't say that she's been misled by, by legal advice, uh, then she's not fit to hold the office. And there you have the Chief Justice infantilizing the public protector herself to protect her from whatever charges, you know, whatever criticism uh, that was, you know, so, so I, I think the public protector was complaining um, uh, in some, I, I can't remember the whole circumstance, but uh, uh, judge, uh, there, there was a judgment that criticized the public protector and uh, for, for some legal position that she had taken. And she said, well, look, this criticism is, is like an insult, uh, which is undeserving, uh, because I was just following legal advice. So you, you can't pin these things to me, and therefore the judgment itself was, um, uh, was essentially a, almost like a impugned the integrity, her integrity, um, and... And uh, there, there was some kind of racial component to this as well, because the Chief Justice, uh, I don't know where the racial in component came into it, but, but it was part of the, um, the comments that the Chief Justice had already made in this case uh, before, before judge. I, I didn't actually see what the judgment actually was, but you could see from the preliminary comments that the Chief Justice made that he was essentially siding with the public protector. And it was, it was disgusting seeing how people that have the same ideology that essentially that you should be protected just because like you're trying to represent doing the right thing for your identity. Okay, I have sketched this out very badly um, because I can't remember all the, the pertinent details of, of this particular case. And, and, and of the comments that the Chief Justice made. But I, I made a recording uh, commenting on this uh, directly, and it, 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 was, it was just disgusting to me because it was very clear that for the ideological narrative to be vindicated and to ensure, let's say, the... Uh, the good standing of the racialist pride, which is validated and confirmed by essentially uh, vindicating the ideological narrative that essentially the, you know, as long as your intentions are correct and you're trying to do the right thing, uh, according to the narrative, according to the ideology, it doesn't matter the procedure that is taken. It doesn't matter the route, you know, the, the ends will always justify the means. And it, to, to me, it, it was a flagrant example of how this disgusting, loose associative thinking is just used to cherry pick data, is used to, is used to confirm loose correlations as, as, as explanations. 
and, and the new tar reality all with the same prejudice brush and it is done in the name of, of whatever high it's done by the chief justice just as this kind of tri cheap trick is perpetrated by the South African Human Rights Commission and uh, you know so, so we're stuck with this very disgusting contradiction um, that is like a dagger in the heart of the new South Africa and because it cannot call a spade a spade because it cannot say well you know the reason why we have these problems is because the political climate is so toxic and the reason why the political climate is so toxic is essentially because the ANC is hedging all of its sort of eggs in the basket of this project of restoring racialist pride as a proxy and as a kind of as a pressure release valve of their essential generally speaking political uh, malfeasance uh, and and uh, you know sort of the denigration of the state itself and state power in order to facilitate you know sort of unseemly escalations of uh, encroaching you know uh, just even common necessary things you know like uh, I mean it's, I mean it, 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 it's it's quite broad uh, you know just the, the level of denigration uh, that South Africa as, as, a, as a as a collective concept has gone through I mean you know it, it, it is something that must just be common cause must be generally regarded uh, that you know um, the fiscus of the country uh, is in probably a state of unarrestable uh, unarrestable decline um, the You know, there are too many things that, that, that can be mentioned that are essentially um, pessimistic indicators uh, as to the fact that, you know, the New South Africa has, has been, uh, the hope of the New South Africa uh, has been quashed. But, I mean, it is my contention that all of these things are precipitates and byproducts and symptoms of the fact that we lost our morality, that we allowed this kind of corruption to, and rot uh, to set in. Because we did not guard our normative values, we did not guard um, the principles that hold up the new South Africa. Uh, were replaced by people who changed the meaning of ordinary words, who invented whole strange secondary legislations that elaborated concepts like social justice into essentially its antithesis. Um, and under the weight of that convoluted and confused uh, uh, moral decadence which now requires uh, a whole sort of secondary economy of pseudo-intellectualism and, and people who could come in and, and sort of play these weird sort of armchair f philosophy, you know, sort of uh, arbitration over people's um, you know, sort of mind reading people's intentionality and mind reading, uh, you know, what is the impediment, uh, you know, and, and sort of, and, and sort of judging people and trying to, uh, cast them into, in, into some kind of stupid dichotomy as to not proffering enough sympathy to the right identity as being essentially what, compassion means now 
and, and, and is the definition of what empathy means now. Empathy has, has um, come to be renamed um, as, as what sympathy used to be. So, you know, we, we have uh, a toxic moral climate and we, and we have no one with the independence and the, the rigorous thinking that can essentially stand up against a state that has already corrupted institutions uh, probably beyond the realm of... Um, recapitulation at least I mean perhaps not under their own steam I mean I guess that's that's the problem so I would go if I went to the summit I would just be barking at people that don't even have the capacity and the institutional independence uh, to say that well the problem really is, is is the secondary legislation is the promotion of Equality Act of 2008, that that is essentially a driver of this toxic racial consciousness, as is this toxic discourse of people that very clearly do not understand what non-racialism is, um, and seek to advance its fraudulent um, forged replica And the necessity of that fraud is, is sealed by a kind of political expediency, um, which is why you have this very strange alliance between the ANC and the EFF, uh, which is an unspoken alliance, but essentially it's the, the, between a rock and a hard place. And uh, the new South Africa is not going to... Um, emerge under these conditions. I mean, it's not going to re-emerge. It's not going to be resurrected. Um, if one of, if, if one of these institutions, if between the ANC and the EFF, if one of them is not um, openly confronted and ideologically disintegrated, um, you know, we're just going to have more of a, a a slow boil of a liberal open democracy that has already had a lot of its institutions uh, corrupted uh, and in open defiance and betrayal of its uh, cornerstone values. Um, so yeah, sadly, there's generally only pessimism um, but yeah, I mean, these are people who just they haven't thought too much about morality and generalizations and how to responsibly uh, navigate having generalizations as everyone must have generalizations in their mind, but learning how to recognize between using generalizations and suspending and controlling one's utilization or extension of generalizations against individuals, when, when to do so would obviously um, bring about a, a morally deficient procedure and, and that's why you have normative ethics that frame how you procedurally engage and negotiate 
and relate to things. And there are some ways in which generalizations can be used because they are morally neutral. They are morally, it's an amoral question. But the idea that you're going to sort of augment people's generalizations and augment them with a kind of enforced sympathy is, frankly, it's, uh, it's insulting to the notion of intelligence. It, I mean, it, it is to demand that people uh, stupefy themselves in some kind of uh, strangely surreal, hyper, you know, it, it, it's sort of, it's the kind of hyperrealism that creates this weird kind of mythologized reality in which you have just reinvigorated the racialist imagination and you've just called it something else, but you've said that, oh, well, we're using it in a positive way. We're using it to kind of inject some sympathetic uh, uh, sort of compensatory chauvinism that we can just kind of project onto people that they deserve as a group to have it and they as an individual haven't achieved it but we can kind of compensate by deluding our vision of reality that we can just kind of reorder and and filter reality with a kind of ideological um, adjustment uh, and as soon as you employ that kind of uh, way of interfacing with reality and with other people, I mean, you've just completely lost the plot. In fact, you've also made it so it's impossible to actually have authentic transformation. Uh, now, now you've made it impossible to see how you would even achieve transformation because you've essentially just enforced the reinterpretation of reality in order to achieve something artificially, uh, which now you'll never be able to notice if you achieved it or not, pragmatically and in reality, as it were. Um, and, you know, this is how you get into essentially hypocrisy and double standards and also the over-reliance on blanket accusations like saying, well, society is racist. Uh, what does that even mean? How would you ever escape such a blanket accusation? How would you ever cope with such a blanket complaint? You know, how would you ever do anything about it? You know, it's to frame the issue in such a way so as to make it insoluble. And if it's an insoluble problem, then you give credence to this kind of self-delusional uh, project of so-called anti-racism, which essentially what it does is it also um, it makes it impossible uh, it has lots of toxic consequences but but essentially it, it actually has quite a disgusting way of actually inculcating and sort of generating the problem that it seeks to automatically compensate for it sort of because it ends up sort of expecting the problem in some form and so it sort of it, it creates a kind of preemptive tolerance that you have to preemptively tolerate things um, that are substandard, but that have to kind of be automatically adjusted for by everyone else. And, you know, it's a seductive, let's say, theoretical solution or hypothetical solution. Uh, you only lose your common humanity by going that route. Um, and you also completely pollute the notion of non-racialism. Um, by essentially saying that the way to be non-racialist is to uh, put
put special filters onto reality uh, to compensate for things that you don't understand. Which is quite an undignified form of moral treachery to force people to sort of I mean, and, and then they've got these disgusting words to describe it, where they call it being someone's ally, where you're going to kind of have this compatriotism in this kind of systemic treachery that is meant to kind of dovetail to the systemic oppression, that, that your kind of, your, your collective systemic treachery against reality will be able to suppress and compensate for all the problems and so you kind of have a theoretical moral narrative that is the panacea to any practical challenge um, the truth is is that any real solution to any problem really has to be creative or inventive. It, it can't, it, it's not going to be, oh, you're doing something wrong. It has to be something like, oh, here's something, here's a suggestion about what you could be doing. Uh, or, or that we could all be doing in some sense. I mean, a lot of reason why people don't like each other is because they don't have common interests. They, they don't have uh, common uh, they don't have enough shared uh, anchoring features that are commonly held that can support uh, let's say interesting and useful uh, uh, exchanges and um, you, 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 why would you communicate with anyone unless they had something uh, that you wanted to um, admire essentially and if if Essentially, if you're going to say that people don't need to have genuine admiration for one another, that instead there's another way to get respect, you can get it by demanding sympathy for someone's identity. You know, you, you've just created, obviously, an impossible recipe that is going to end in disaster. Uh, you know, you, you've just created a kind of a weirdly demonic antithesis of of human dignity in some sense um, you know if, if you really want to create social co cohesion you know we need to have we need to care about the same sports maybe or we or we have to participate in the same kind of activities or we have to have the same kind of interests I mean I'm, I'm talking very broadly and generally speaking and, and let's look, like, where has these things been undermined? It's been undermined by the ANC government. I mean, also to a large extent, uh, to the extent to which um, the narrative about development, you know, which is very strange that somehow the private sector takes all the blame for the lack of development of the country and the people who actually set the policy um, somehow they are being held hostage by white monopoly capital and other such disgusting concepts um, so you've got this you've got this weird inversion of values that somehow whatever happens the political elites are the victims because of the because of their identity and uh, the private sector somehow is a kind of surrogate uh, government. You know, it, it's weird. I mean, what's also weird is, is these, these strange inversions where essentially the government tasks itself with 
delivering goods and services to people in some sense. And yeah, it's, it's, it's this weird juxtaposition between the private sector and the public sector, uh, which I mean really has to do with this just very bad management, uh, very bad political policy, which is has never really made sense because it's essentially been there to facilitate um, a kind of plutocratic uh, extraction. And, and not being able to come to a common view of this is in, in the ruling party's best interest. And so, I mean, a lot of this is just, I would say, a kind of a byproduct of the toxicity of the ANC itself and the health of the ANC itself, which is a decrepit and decadent um, organization. And, you know, under, if, if we can't come into some kind of general consensus that the ANC is, is largely parasitic and, and essentially, uh, uh, you know, in some sense, that's what the schism really is, is, is the ANC a parasite or not? And are parties like the EFF parasitic? I mean, that, in a nutshell, is why we don't have social cohesion, is because there's no agreement on that point. And why don't we have agreement on that point? Is because of essentially using the ANC as a proxy for the project of restoring racialist pride in the black race, in the black identity, or something like that. And so, in some sense, criticism of the ANC gets conflated with... Uh, an accusation that impugns the project to restore, uh, and let me use their disgusting, conflated reasoning and, and terms, it's something is, it's, it challenges the notion of black equality. Now, you know, this, in real non-racialism, if this was the normative morality, this wouldn't be a problem, because there's no such thing as black equality, there's no such thing as white equality, there's no such thing as white, there's no such thing as black. Those are labels. And as a non-racialist, there is only one race. The colorblind vision. But the colorblind vision is not endorsed anymore. Who endorses it? Who talks about it? I mean, no, instead you hear the buzzwords out of the South African Human Rights Commission. You hear all the wrong buzzwords. You don't hear anything about colorblindness because they don't preach it. They don't understand it anymore. They have also betrayed it. That is a slight projection from my part because I haven't looked through all of their diversity and sensitivity training but I have heard enough from their people to know that it's a toxic mess, that it's just as poisonous as the EFF and the ANC, which are all, as far as I'm concerned, singing from the same hymn sheet. Some might be singing in baritone, some might be tenors, uh, but it's the same bullshit. It's the same racialist nonsense. And it's why we're in the mess that we're in. And these people, I'll make the same threat that I always make. That if we do have a genocide in this country, if we do have a cataclysm, if we do have, and, and at the end of it, we end up with some kind of Nuremberg trial, um, obviously then I'll have to make sure that I've done my homework, or I mean, or maybe I'll be dead, but someone will listen to this recording and, and think, of, think on this, and perhaps be inspired. Uh, when we have our, our Nuremberg trials, uh, that the South African Human Rights Commission was uh, part of this instrumental and incremental uh, uh, 
debauchery of what was a perfectly good constitution that was merely reinterpreted into utter contemptible racialist slime and depravity and i guess you know this is uh I mean, this is why everything is failing at the moment. This is why culture is failing. This is why art is failing. Um, we, we don't have a common moral standard. People don't even, I think, remember what it felt like to, to be alive in the 90s, to have that kind of moral bedrock that that contextualized and framed the idea you know that we all conceivably had quite clearly the same vision of moral progress and how with just sort of this, this disgusting ideological contortion uh, you know, which, which happened in, in drips and drabs, um, the promotion of Equality Act, uh, secondary legislation, it's called. open the door to this political, I don't know, I'll call it vampirism. And now we have, uh, we have too many personalities and, and political figures, but also there's a section of the population which will always be prone to being hijacked by this kind of cultural programming because it, it actually does match up with their own preferred style of interacting you know that they they like being field marshals they like some people are just more have a, have a, have a natural temperament that essentially lets them be sort of high functioning borderline personality disordered individuals that just need to be associated with a self-image, with an identity that allows them to act as a field marshal, that allows them to play games with the narrative and be able to project accusations at people. And, and this is why, you know, one person's interpretation of racism is another person's authentic participation and the idea is is just essentially well yeah the reason why you're calling something racist is because you feel entitled to something uh based on a theory that you can read my mind and that you know why i do everything that i do uh do you not understand why that's a bit uh why perhaps no one is that friendly around you because you think you have that special power that you can read the heart of, of people that you can project blanket accusations onto people because you've got an arsenal of blanket accusations, which has been supplied by these pseudo intellectual moral halfwits and, and moral midgets that have essentially made it impossible to have authentic relations between people because they have muddied the field that they've dirtied the plane in which we need to be able to confront each other and see each other as individuals foremost but which has already been contextualized or decontextualized 
in some kind of identitarian narrative and drama in which all moral consideration is vested and derived from belonging to the group of the oppressor or, or, or the oppressed. Anyway, I can go on and on and on. It's, it's just... Uh, these people, they can't give up their simplistic narrative. They, they can't say, well, life is actually more complicated than taking this bird's eye view over people and assuming that we can read their minds and, and assuming we can attach a, a causative explanation onto the onto one person's subjective description of what happened when, when you can do this to people when you can attach these moral labels onto people in such a projective way you have just proven that your morality is essentially just a, a it's a game at that point it's 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 a superficial a attribution that can be made uh the actual the process that arbitrates that that labeling is in fact uh very much akin to the to the, to the concept and the principle of what was even uh, uh officially crowned in, not, in, in Weimar Germany and then later Nazi Germany as the Führer principle. That someone can break the relativism paradox, that they can judge society, even though that they are a member of society, they are somehow elected to, to be beyond it and to look down upon it in judgment and to be able to arbitrate over the social constructs. Um, And, and that is, I'm afraid, is a little bit what the South African Human Rights Commission is um, de facto somewhat uh, uh, testing the grounds for, is essentially the, the slow evolution of the Führer principle, um, which is that we need arbitration in this kind of way. Uh, which, look, I mean, it's, it's not wrong to necessarily have a commission that makes findings and that makes recommendations but the kind of moral standard that is being applied and the kind of uh, moral metrics and moral values and moral principles which are being defined make all the difference and uh, I mean everything that I have seen I mean they, they try to you know, they're not leaning into the ideological stuff, or at least they're, they're trying to put, you know, some very sharp window dressing on it uh, th that makes it look like it's objective and even-handed. Um, but I'm sorry, you, you, you use the wrong morality and uh, there's no escaping the toxic... Uh, consequences and, and natural precipitation which will be unavoidable which is you know uh, the compounding of this cultural decline and doom spiral which is now what South Africa is it's a it's a slow motion train wreck Okay, well, that's enough of my pessimistic ranting. Uh, this is addendum to the last recording that I made. Um, I, I didn't uh, use the word which I feel like it, it would have been useful for me to bring up, which is meritocracy. That uh, essentially... Without people having the same moral principles and moral values, um, uh, without the same level of uh, uh, 
without having that that sort of that conceptual equality um in in the moral paradigm in the moral domain um being able to respect somebody else's ethics i would say that that, that is a sort of a, a, a prerequisite to having any kind of genuine negotiation or interaction with somebody else is that is that first of all it can be regarded that, that we share the same morality but when you have the kind of morality of anti-racism um it means that people can rely on a special pleading that gets invoked for their group. And so you've kind of destabilized and made it impossible for people to kind of use morality to access a kind of a shared common vision and, and, and an idea of what common decency looks like, because now decency gets filtered in a, in a frankly, in a racialized way. Um, and essentially that form of morality is corrosive and undermines any kind of meritocracy. And, and meritocracy is important for people on an ethical level as well. So essentially this new form of morality is a weird kind of anti-morality. And how it operates is that it means that people can no longer say, is this individual, is it meritorious? that I admire this individual or not. And people can no longer confront themselves with that question. And therefore it's impossible essentially to have an authentic friendship with someone under the new uh, cultural rubric, uh, which is frankly uh, toxic and corrosive to having um, a society with I mean, you know, let's say the the natural prerequisite for social cohesion is that we we have the same sort of common standards of decency, where instead those those standards are no longer principles and values, but they are outcomes uh, that have very superficial um, interpretations of what diversity and sensitivity look like, and they're not normative principles and values, um, they are merely, uh, the ends will justify the means, um, and just arrive at the moral picture, however you do so, and whatever the process will be, you cannot call that process a meritocracy. And so the loss of the, of the moral standing of a meritocracy in which we can, uh, inhabit the same moral paradigm and the same moral space that instead these uh, category distinctions need to be arbitrated um, via uh, special pleading and, and special instruments which can be invoked and raised by certain people of certain groups. Uh, is essentially uh, why we have this kind of this catch-22 when we have the version of non-racialism, which is nothing but, uh, uh, that I would argue is, is being proffered by the experts and by the psychologists and by, you know, the, the people who are injected to uh, concoct what I would say is, is a very sort of disgusting narrative which dehumanizes people and which sort of uh, slaps intersectional labels onto them and then forces everyone to have this perfect ideological conformity uh, to compensate people for the deficiencies in their identitarian pride. And so that by equaling out identitarian pride, uh, something like the outcome of non-racialism is, is supposedly achieved when this is the antithesis of non-racialism. Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to make the point that, um, let's say, the, the normative system of meritocracy uh, and, and a kind of moral 
meritocracy is an important prerequisite to allowing for genuine admiration between individuals to occur uh, that is not coerced or enforced um, by some kind of superficial amoral metric. Um, and, and when you force people to sort of employ, let's say, uh, fake ethics or fraudulent ethics, uh, you actually end up demeaning them. You end up stripping them of dignity and you end up replacing that dignity with um, a farce, which is essentially uh, why we have this sort of toxic doubling down on that farce to develop even more sophisticated forms of convoluted, ideologically infused language. Um, but anyway, the, uh, and, and, and this, this, um, but anyway, the, the point that I'm trying to draw out is that meritocracy is an important prerequisite, but it is not sufficient um, for having people get along. You also need to share common values and, let's say, have common interests or have common, um, at least, uh, uh, actual particular um, collaboration or coordination that uh, furthers some shared vision or something like that. Um, and I mean that in the particular, not in some vague, nebulous, general prescription. Um, of going along to get along or something like that, there actually has to be real shared values. And the thing is, is that this version of anti-racism which essentially undermines and destabilizes meritocracy, and that does not um, try to achieve meritocracy, uh, or at least as, as, its, as its starting point, essentially, I mean, I'll just say that the general status of non-racialism within society has been systemically beleaguered by politics, um, specifically the brand of politics that I've already uh, examined and, and, and mentioned uh, of the ANC. And because it is essentially their strategy to um, weaponize and undermine uh, the value of non-racialism, uh, it makes it impossible. And in fact, it, it makes it being around people who are trying to um, cultivate an identitarian consciousness uh, and, and are trying to, you know, uh, enhance some supposedly sophisticated moral paradigm that bandies about words like intersectionality is, um, is, is frankly impossible. It, it, it's, it's frankly farcical. And, and essentially anything that might be done in order to um, enhance such a uh, disgusting moral vision, which is a kind of amorality um, and, and, a, and a superficial moral code that comes to displace actual values. I've got sort of whole recordings that sort of dissect the kinds of the, the almost the, the metaphysical or philosophical inconsistencies that, that just render such uh, systems more and more toxic and more and more surreal and more and more disingenuous. Um, you know, so, I mean, this is why I say that, uh, you know, if, if the lack, if, if the lack of integration or social cohesion is for want of there actually being shared interests, well, first of all, there must be some level of uh, shared moral standards. And, I, and that I will call a value, but then there have to, has to be sort of substantive particular values that need to be shared between people. And essentially, if identity is in that basket, that discludes, let's say, genuine non-racialism. As soon as you tell people that, no, their identity is how they're going to navigate their life and they're not going to share a meritocracy, um, and, and they're, 
you know, and, and non-racialism and meritocracy aren't just sort of um, cold, unfeeling things. This is why you're supposed to have particular policy from government which seeks to ameliorate disadvantages, that targets disadvantages. That is how equality is meant to be enhanced under the Constitution, but that is not how the ANC sees disadvantage. Uh, the ANC has uh, systematically and vaguely projected disadvantage uh, in, in quite a racialist way. And so, uh, you know, it is, is part of the ideological problem, as it were, um, that makes it impossible, essentially, to achieve non-racialism. And so, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't even know what prescription to make. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't make any prescription because the, the problem is, um, is, is so... Uh, entrenched and and the south african human rights commission is as far as i can see is part of the problem um in in keeping the the actual uh you know you know you cannot you cannot try to clean up the symptoms of something that you are frankly a part of of perpetrating um the the the, the moral in incoherence and and essentially uh, uh continuing to pass off the depravity um but uh, sorry, the, the point that, that I was going to get to is that um, that in, in a perfect world, uh, what you would try to do is, is if, the, if the morality was sort of in line, you know, if we actually had uh, the kind of consciousness, uh, the kind of non-racialism, consciousness which uh sort of had its heydays in the 90s um uh which has subsequently uh been diluted and and essentially destabilized and discredited on an ideological level and displaced and supplanted um Is that if if you if that wasn't the primary problem and it is so what I'm going to say is is purely a kind of a tangent and, and a hy hypothetical is is what you would try to do is you would try to give these individuals something in common something to share uh, something you know the same sporting activities the same uh, celebrities the same icons the same role models they would have things that they shared that, uh, you know, also had a kind of, um, you know, so, so having some pool of shared interests, which I would say is, is a generally sort of natural thing, because most of life, in some sense, um, cross-culturally, across a lot of things, is somewhat generic, you know, and... Um, people are different and they have different inclinations and they have different interests. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, uh, there'll be subsets of, of every population that are thus inclined towards those general broad sort of generic categories of interest. Um, I mean, the problem is, is just that essentially uh, identitarian chauvinism or identitarian um, uh, the ideological um, sort of moral pluralism which uh, has uh, essentially undermined and destroyed non-racialism uh, even you know where, where you know where it's clear that the president himself will invoke the the term non-racialism but he obviously has no idea what it actually means because you know his whole uh, all of his sentiments, all of his uh, views, um, are are quite frankly uh, toxic to non-racialism. Um, 
and he, he very clearly expects a kind of identitarian sympathy um, and racialist sympathy that must be installed within essentially what becomes a new racial imagination. Um, you know, so essentially the hypocrisy, the toxic hypocrisy as it's not being identified, as it's not being underlined, as it's not been pointed out, means that you now have essentially um, an impossible impediment to some kind of social cohesion around non-racialism. Um, I mean, journalism and activists, activist journalists are, uh, you know, another key driver of this. I mean, I, I haven't heard his radio program for a long time uh, because I have since sort of cut that radio station out of my life. But Julius uh, Eusebius MacKaiser, you know, um, and, and the kinds of commentary that, that is, is the spin and the interpretation that is put on, you know, uh, the hateful and disgusting things that issue from Julius Malema. Um, but, you know, I mean, I've heard Eusebius MacKaiser on public radio say such egregious things uh, and, and, and perform such constitutional damage and literally, I mean, essentially um, completely undermining uh, uh, foundational human rights. I mean, I, I, I sent an email, I, I wanted, uh, uh, I wanted some record of a radio show, because I, I was going to use it as, as evidence and, and make a formal complaint. It was so disgusting. Um, uh, he said something roughly to the effect in, in one of his radio shows, that uh, he, he literally said uh, something to the effect of, um, I'm not calling for a genocide, or uh, I'm not saying, uh, but uh, if we did have a genocide in this country, uh, no one would say uh, that it was completely unjustified. And, and this is the kind of, uh, I mean, can you even call it disguised racism, which... Uh, quite clearly has its place and its day in the sun in enforcing this kind of pervasive ideological narrative that uh, now has adopted and, and usurped uh, the term, oh, not only social justice, but, but non-racialism. This is what now non-racialism means, is that you have to believe crazy blanket accusations, which then inform part of your worldview in order to sort of apply a compensatory racial pride to groups of people because those individuals don't um, exemplify any kind of moral integrity uh, and, and, and sort of and shared values. So instead, um, we have to kind of lean on sort of ideological scapegoating and a kind of collective guilt uh, uh, projected on, on the right group of people in order to essentially create a kind of um, a formulaically derived, unmeritorious um, moral picture, which is, is a weird form of ideological parasitism, um, which effectively operates in, in a racial imagination. Uh, you know, so you have this unsettling and impossible um, new form of racist ideology uh, that somehow has found a way to semantically appropriate moral language and, and, and appropriate the language of the Constitution. And uh, people have not been sensitive uh, to this kind of usurpation, and they've just kind of gone along with the ride, uh, because semantically, uh, they, I guess, you know, they fall into using these proffered constituents of the moral picture, which are littered everywhere in the culture, and no one is bothering to clean up, and, and, and bothering to very carefully um, put the right warning labels on, 
as essentially these are racist instruments and they're used by racist people and uh, or, or, or racialist uh, um, racially obsessed ideologues and uh, adherents uh, to an identitarian dehumanizing um, frankly I mean I would just call them proto-fascist and this proto-fascism has uh, exploded um, as in it's spread everywhere within the culture um, and you know it, it has double standards it, it's hypocritical um, and essentially it, it's uh, it perpetrates this because of the use of, of blanket accusations and when you've got this bank of blanket accusations which you can invoke and project on people at will then you're always going to have this kind of this moral this fudged moral inexactitude where you can always cherry pick some kind of statistic or you can correlate something to, to prove how people are um, perpetrating some element of, of systemic oppression which is felt by an identity and, and these concepts are so vague and so premised in a racialist um, You know, and, and, and no one realizes that essentially it's it's the lack of, of sort of basic understanding in, in what a meritocracy is and how it is to be achieved um, procedurally. And uh, sorry, I, I, I was going to say, so essentially th this doesn't mean that, that the government cannot um, do things to help disadvantaged people. It just means that it actually has to achieve those things in order to ameliorate the disadvantage. So, so that we can actually see, well, you know, because just because people, let's just say, are uh, starting off with a disadvantage doesn't mean that that has to augment their identity. It means that there is something perhaps that can be done. Some disadvantages perhaps cannot be ameliorated, in which case that's just too bad. Because we need to live in a meritocracy that has a non-racialist foundation to it. And we cannot just inherit things that are insoluble and then continue to think that there's a moral consequence that can be scapegoated and projected onto people. If something cannot be done, if disadvantages cannot be ameliorated, that is too bad. And essentially, you know, and, and in some sense we have to understand very clearly what, uh, well, in, in this kind of context, what fair discrimination means. Um, but, you know, I mean, th there is so much confusion and, and there's so much sort of fallacious and erroneous thinking, which has to do with very poor understanding of even words themselves. That, for example, I mean, the word discriminate has a neutral meaning to it. It doesn't mean necessarily bigotry and prejudice. And and, and again, I mean, even the, the word prejudice uh, can be used incorrectly when it's used in a racialist way, because essentially prejudicing the interest of an identity and is not the same thing as prejudice that is felt as an individual or by an individual. And when you equivocate those two things as being the same thing, that if you prejudice the interests of an identity, identities don't have interests. That's a mythological construct. That's a racialist imagination, consciousness that you've got there. So the idea that you can prejudice the interests of someone's identity this is a fictitious overlay. This is an ideological projection. Just forget that. The question is, has the individual been, has their right, has the individual's right of equality been infringed? What is the actual, so, you know, alleged cause of the infringement? And, and, and this is important because if you, you're going to diagnose, you're going to explain the wrong explanation. If you're not, tra if you're saying, well, 
how was this person's identity treated rather than how was this individual treated? Was this individual treated arbitrarily because of associating them with some kind of group label, or some kind of group identity? But if you believe that there is a kind of uh, truth to the identity label to begin with, and, and you start by saying, well, what was the moral consideration that was delivered to this person's identity? If, if that is your uh, uh, initial uh, conceptual starting point, you've already sacrificed non-racialism. You've already thrown it under the bus. Uh, and you say, oh, there hasn't been the requisite sympathy. And this idea that a kind of blanket sympathy is demanded is the undermining of meritocracy. So the question is, is, do these people have a specific disadvantage? Is that disadvantage being catered to? Uh, uh, is it being um, attended to? Is it being treated in some kind of a transformative um, program? And uh, it might be true that some disadvantages are insoluble, that they have uh, no recourse, but that might also be for lack of imagination, for lack of actually conceiving of something. Um, you know, I mean, there might be ways and means of, of doing certain things when you allow yourself to kind of be somewhat creative rather than trying to fix the outcome by essentially fudging and distorting the moral structure and a moral and, and sort of trying to invoke a moral procedure which is fundamentally backwards um, and so you know we've got this very sort of disgusting sort of thing where these politicians can leverage these kinds of incidents uh, by trying to force onto people a kind of inauthentic you know trying to put a square pig peg in a round hole uh, and, and, and trying to force people to swallow prescriptions and basically a kind of toxic and artificial um, shackling of what is, at the end of the day, a form of, of sort of, um, you know, because if you can force people to march to your tune under the banner that, you know, it's, it's, you're morally bettering someone when you are contextualizing the whole issue from the start, from a hypocritical, uh, it, you know, through, through a hypocritical filter and uh, uh, something that is fundamentally sort of toxic to individuals freely making their own decisions and allowing private citizens and private individuals um, to enjoy, let's say, freedom of association. Uh, you know, if, if, if these things are not held in, in some important regard, if these things are trumped by some kind of, frankly, racialist theory about some kind of moral picture that needs to be arrived at, you've really lost the plot, you understand. You've really just undermined the thing that you were supposedly interested in rehabilitating. Um, and so, you know, this is why... Equality is, is, a, is, a, is a very sophisticated and nuanced kind of right. It, it has to, the Constitution has to be read incredibly carefully, incredibly carefully, um, w w when you're actually trying to understand it in terms of some kind of uh, normative principle uh, and, and value system. Um, cannot be read superficially. You cannot just extract, let's say, literal interpretations. It, 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 it has to be understood in context. Uh, it, it has to be... Um, and, and, and this is why, essentially, equality can, cannot be enforced. It has to be progressively enhanced. Equality can be enhanced. It cannot be installed. Very, very important. It is, it is on that level of 
of essentially sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, it, it is, it is, and and frankly, uh, it is, it is such a delicate, um, obviously a very important uh, uh, issue to have tackled. But essentially, we have to understand that the failings uh, uh, that that we currently see are not failings of civil society. Uh, they are failings of essentially government power, uh, which is uh, organized along principles which are fundamentally toxic and antithetical to non-racialism. Uh, so, again, this is not a failing of actual non-racialism. This is um, a failing of, of racist politicians, um, which are now clearly invested in an ideology of hate, which clothes itself and pa packages itself in a kind of um, morally prescriptive and, and yet caustic and corrosive um, uh, uh, poison, which are uh, delivered to people uh, via even uh, the, the so-called institution um, or obviously it is an institution, but uh, a corrupted institution like the South African Human Rights Commission. Um, so certainly this is the state uh, that we are in. Uh, this is the predicament now, and I mean, I, I can't even think of uh, I won't say more because it's just it's sort of it's it's too jaded and perhaps pessimistic as to I mean I'm just trying to imagine a path to how things might be solved and, and essentially I, I don't even want to say it out loud because it will just sort of maybe discredit uh, the things that I have intellectually um, spoken on uh, which sh should I think at least is, is some very clear thinking um, So let me not dilute it with uh, the theories about how the political situation um, or the or the moral situation uh, uh, might regain its prominence. Because uh, anyway, I just said I didn't want to mention it. So. Um, Let me just, I mean, I, I won't elaborate, but let me just say that essentially we effectively need another revolution, essentially, of some kind or another um, that has the right morality at its base. But um, this is effectively not possible uh, or it's unlikely uh, or if we did have a revolution, that's the kind of chaos which the fascists are quite eager uh, to pounce on, uh, to prov I mean, they're actually quite clearly stoking some kind of destabilization. Um, because that's how plutocrats and, and revolutionaries, you know, sort of gain access uh, to becoming the new aristocracy, as it were, um, of, of what is essentially an overburdened uh, plutocracy uh, that is in decline. Uh, I mean, th that is what South Africa has, has um, transferred into, is, is that we're, we're effectively a kind of uh, plutocracy that is so badly managed that we need a divisive ideological um, 
consciousness in order to distract uh, from the political unaccountability and the sort of the structural um, doom spiral. Anyway. This is a third ad addendum. For completeness sake, I'm just going to explore uh, and, and sort of deconstruct um, just how toxic sort of this, this the, the version of, of racial consciousness that I've been critiquing. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about why it's so destructive um, and also link it back to the concept of, of meritocracy, which is important. Um, uh, so the, the the problem is is that identity politics um, allows people a form of um, disingenuous self esteem. It 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 actually it, it lies to them about what self esteem is, and essentially self esteem just becomes another feature of an ideological narrative of a of a racist worldview essentially which is um, incorrectly uh, and, and sort of ironically labeled anti-racist. Um, and I mean, it's almost in the phrase or, or in the term anti-racist is that it requires a racist. If It requires racism. It requires your society to be racist. It requires some kind of blanket accusation in order to uh, facilitate and to maintain let's say, uh, would become a kind of psychological addiction uh, to um, a form of self-esteem, which is fundamentally, um, well, it's dysfunctional because the individual cannot access that self-esteem. The self-esteem is delivered to the identity. And so to the extent to which that you represent your identity, you gain access to that self-esteem and because this is all perpetrated uh, or, or, or administered or tracked and evaluated via the ideological worldview or, or narrative, uh, you need to constantly be reminded that you belong to that category, that you belong um, to that identity. And somehow you have to kind of invoke that identity. And the only excuse you have for doing so is... Uh, in confronting systemic oppression or racism, which can effectively be read into anything. It can be, so, I mean, this is why I'm literally desensitized. Anyone, someone complains about racism, I'm completely desensitized to it now because this ideological version of racism doesn't require intention. It doesn't, because essentially, I mean, the critical race theory is, is so disgusting that essentially they can just they can project it onto anyone because they they just say well you you have internalized your own white supremacy so it's a kind of uh it's a thought crime that can be imputed onto your thinking without you actually thinking it so you know uh you know imagine that for a kind of standard of morality i mean it's uh it's like inception you know it's like a surrealist um you know, it, it, it's just crazy. It's unwieldy. It's, uh, you know, what are you talking about? You have to agree with the theorist who proposes such a disgusting um, gaslighting sort of project, which essentially just keeps on doubling down in its gaslighting. Um, that if you don't agree with the theory, then there's something wrong with you. And we've got the psychologists that have, you know, the white lab coats that represent to us, you know, some kind of intellectual legitimization of our narrative and you know it's um you know i mean and you end up with psychologists talking about statistics you know it's like what's going on here you you know you you've got uh essentially a field which is largely a discredit to itself but i mean this is because uh the state of psychology is is uh is just undeveloped. Um, 
so you, you've got essentially a, a field of, of pseudoscientists uh, leveraging lies, lies, and statistics uh, and, and moral contortions and, and contriving uh, essentially the atmosphere that morality is, is essentially is too complicated for people uh, to understand. They just need to follow the program. They just need to install the program and they need to link themselves up to the moral picture and the ends justify the means. And, and essentially morality gets diluted into a non-normative, um, amoral, you know, sort of prescription. And, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, so, so let me just get, get back to talking about why identity consciousness and identity politics is so toxic to its own adherents. And so when you have this generalized claim against your racist society, um, you have to ground that, you have to anchor that perspective, that complaint. You, you have to, uh, uh, you know, if you're going to invoke it, how, how is it going to manifest? Uh, how are you going to bring it up? And the only way to bring it up is to make someone a token, is to make someone symbolically representative of, of the system, of even the systemic oppression. So someone has to be representative of the systemically oppressed and someone has to be represented uh, a representative of of the systemic oppressor and you know uh all the while all you are doing is inflating the importance uh, of some category of some identity and by representing this greater importance of this identity somehow that's supposed to make an individual feel good by essentially enforcing the importance of, of the identity and bringing and making someone absorb the, the complaint on behalf of the identity. I mean, this is completely, I mean, this is why you can't have non-racialism and why non-racialism has been destroyed. It's been destroyed by this toxic um, adaptation. But, but what's worse is this means that people's self-esteem is essentially welded to this form of, of racism, essentially, um, of, of finding scapegoats and, and participating in witch hunts and trying to discern codes of conduct, uh, which amount to supposedly moving towards the moral picture that, that should be the, the, the moral outcome and which has now displaced and supplanted normative morality. And when this whole process that everyone is seen as being a part of uh, uh, participating in, when you're in the midst of that uh, process, uh, you have just dehumanized everyone. You, everyone has to play their token identity role within the narrative. And so if anything is done for you or to you, it's not because of you as an individual, it's because of you as an identity. And it must be because of the identity, because that is how you, you proffer the correct, let's say, compensatory sympathy, uh, and uh, which must be paid out of uh, an ideological guilt and a collective shame that is extracted from the perpetrator uh, class or the perpetrator category or identity. And so you have a kind of self-esteem that is a kind of parasitic, ideological parasitism and, or a kind of vampirism. And this is much the same as narcissistic supply uh, to a narcissist, is that they are addicted to narcissistic supply, but they never enjoy it. And this is the same way in this ideology. They are addicted to needing to find a scapegoat to absorb the criticism, to keep the worldview spinning, to keep the worldview in view and, and turning and in vogue and, and to keep it alive. Because without some kind of ritualistic 
uh, uh, playing out of, of, of finding someone to absorb that, the blanket accusation, then you don't know that you're part of the solution of, of solving uh, uh, this insoluble conception of systemic racism. You know, this is, this is why you, know, you should not believe in things that are, frankly, vague generalizations. Or, I mean, you, can, you, you might believe in them in, in an abstracted sort of in, 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 in a way, but you would never think that you could deploy those, those perspectives on people uh, because it would be kind of like an anti, it would be an anti norm. It would be crossing so many normative lines and, and it would be crossing so many structures within morality that you wouldn't have a functioning morality if you did so. And, and this is what we have done. We have basically abused the concept and the notion of, of ethics and morality in order to facilitate a kind of ideologically compensatory subversion of reality. And uh, because of this, we're in a sort of an insoluble mess. But anyway, I was just going to say that um, this kind of ideological self-esteem that you garner via the vehicle of your identity means that it's impossible for you to actually generate self-confidence. And it's also impossible for you to have an authentic uh, evaluation and navigation of your own life according to trust. You know, you have to make up the idea of why do you trust and who do you trust and how do you trust and, and how do you negotiate um, your life and navigate your life as an individual. And this... Um, this idea that we should be responsible for curating who we trust and how we trust and why we trust is essentially ends up being displaced by the ideology of identitarian consciousness. Um, that you can automatically trust identity categories to tell you the kind of sort of, it's almost like aut automating trust and dehumanizing it by allowing the narrative to dictate who you should trust. So the only thing that you could actually trust, therefore, becomes your identity. You, you only trust your identity. Because your identity is your source of this toxic self-esteem, which can never be cashed out as self-confidence. Uh, because in some sense, the only way that you can access that self-esteem is if you quite disgustingly and racialistically believe that the identity owns you as an individual, that yourself is owned. And, and, they, and then you have the, the complete, let's just say, undoing of the non-racialist uh, uh, paradigm and, 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 and value system has now been completely, you know, uh, you know and, and maybe people haven't made all these connections in their heads, but essentially that is the implicit um, endemic evolution um, that is inculcated within the so-called anti-racist worldview um, is that eventually if they want to uh, enjoy the self-esteem uh, and the special pleading and, and the kind of um, and the kind of uh, if they want to convert the blanket accusations into um, a particular uh, deployment uh, of of this of that decrepit moral um, system, uh, their identity has to own them. And uh, this is also problematic uh, on the level at which it completely um, denigrates someone having an, an internal locus of control. That essentially, um, they don't, they essentially say, well, instead of having disadvantages and challenges that maybe you need help with 
in terms of how to navigate and, and I mean learning how to ask for the kind of help that you need rather than expecting to be delivered to some outcome that everything must be done to you, the system must cater to you and you, and you don't have to develop an internal locus of control, um, you don't even have to learn how to trust what happens in life, the only thing that you need to trust is the narrative that uh, is the narrative of identities and the drama that occurs between identities because that gives you a kind of universal toolkit that you can invoke that well if you didn't arrive at the outcome that you so desired or in contradistinction to other people's outcomes you can just say well that's because my identity was being systemically oppressed and so instead of actually quantizing um, challenges to be overcome, you can just kind of simplistically lump them all together and be, let's say, essentially completely irresponsive to your own situation and never having to develop an internal locus of control because the narrative of identity is this kind of toxic external locus of control which you can invoke at any time. And therefore, essentially cultivating this kind of ideological self-esteem from your identity is not only um, not only uh, uh, displaces self-confidence but it, it actually actively um, makes actual self-confidence uh, an impediment to the functioning of the ideology um, I mean, I guess there's just a general toxicity in have in being able to rely on almost the special pleading of an external locus of control, which um, really calcifies someone's integrity and indignity uh, uh, into essentially um, uh, You know, it, 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 it crystallizes them, you know, in, in some racial, racist worldview. And, I mean, this is sadly uh, a problem which now becomes, it, it becomes sort of fuel for this self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, because essentially, a, a lot of the reasons why people are not going to be... Um, integrated into some kind of social co cohesion it is because frankly um, this toxic form of racism is being marketed is being promoted uh, to uh, let me use the phrase that's used in, in America people of color that all people of color are perversely incentivized to cultivate this external locus of control which explains everything uh, which can be deployed as, 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 and, and reflexively as, as, you know, without even, it can be lazily um, invoked and projected onto people at will. Um, and in some sense, this is also why I, I think that there is a general move towards segregation, because the, the, the kind of, the toxicity of this, um, of this moral paradigm means that uh, people will always represent to each other um, unless unless there's a perfect allyship, unless there's a perfect um, pervasive narrative which everyone attests to constantly and everyone ostensibly agrees with and, and, and but even if they did they might still represent to somebody else essentially how beleaguered their identity has become and you actually need someone to represent that because otherwise there's no ideological extraction um, because essentially it doesn't have a positive value as to what, let's say, justice looks like. It only has a definition of what injustice looks like, which requires this polemic and this narrative of systemic oppression. And so it quite disgustingly requires... Um, this this moral dichotomy uh, 
so that the external locus of control can be um, maintained, maintained and leveraged. But, you know, it's a kind of, um, it's a cursed instrument, it's a cursed weapon, because the more that you play that game, um, the more sort of insulated you make yourself, but essentially... Uh, Anyway, I mean, all these facets are, are a bit complicated. But anyway, this is why there has been a general move uh, towards segregation um, in the so-called woke anti-racist camps. Because in some sense, uh, on a de facto level, they realize that the kind of resentment and toxicity which the ideology produces uh, cannot be contained by common observance. It cannot be, um, you know, just, just getting people to pay lip service to the ideology and the ideological narrative stops being enough because essentially it, it is such a, uh, I mean, there are other ways of describing this, but, um, sorry, the self-esteem, self-confidence thing is very important, but I mean, the, the other way of, of describing this whole thing, um, is that essentially, what the individual self feels envious about, the, the monitoring of envy and, and the uh, toxic leveraging of envy within the ideology, um, becomes a corrosive and, and toxic feature of that individual. Um, because envy is, is a source of political power. Because if you can envy something, you can say that your identity should have already received it. It should have already been delivered to the, uh, to the identity. And it shouldn't have to do anything in order to um, possess the thing which is envied. And so essentially, what is, what is actually happening is that envy on the individual side becomes jealousy for the identity. Uh, envy and jealousy do not mean this. Envy means that there's something that you do not have that you want to, uh, to have. And jealousy means that you're afraid that something that, that you own is going to be um, taken away from you. So you're jealous of the attention uh, that your wife might give to somebody else because she's your wife. I'm just making uh, an analogy uh, to show what jealousy is. So, essentially, what in identity politics, uh, this toxic form of self-esteem, uh, uh, but, but also envy, envy gets converted into that this is your injustice about your identity. And so, the whole schema, the whole moral system, is all hinged on this negative concept of what is unjust. It doesn't have a positive definition of what justice is. It only has a negative metric of we need to prevent social injustice and we need to fight social injustice. So it actually centers around what is unjust. It defines what is unjust, and then it fights against it. It's 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 also completely reactionary, but in, in some sense, uh, I can't help but use the word reactionary because it just you know it, it, it is it is built on a reactive premise. It doesn't have a it doesn't have a positive mechanism to achieve something or or, or to or, or to build it authentically. It just says, well, it's missing. So it should be granted, it should be bestowed upon me via my identity. And so there is this toxic relationship between the self, which is permitted to cultivate a, 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 a quite, I mean, I'll just say it's, it's unattractive. Anyone who indulges in that kind of sort of uh, uh, decadent, but, but also stupefying levels of envy, of raw emotional envy, which then can be repurposed as an ideological wellspring of, of political complaint and demand, 
uh, to do with so-called social injustice. Um, this whole mechanism, this whole ideological mechanism, which is effectively orchestrated around the self-image as being an identity, and orchestrated around um, this, this narrative that we all live in the same systemic general culture, you know, that, that somehow the constituents of culture are in their base quality identities, are in their base quality racial groups, that, that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a premise of, of a kind of racial essentialism. The individual has been completely, uh, has been sequestrated and, and, and apportioned into this kind of moral category system. At least we can say that the individual has been deprived of any kind of moral significance and moral consideration, that all moral consideration has been vested into identity factions or into racial factions. And, and this is, this is the, the, the sort of the primary premise that is, is why essentially anti-racism, so-called, um, and identity politics and identity consciousness is fundamentally antithetical to non-racialism. It also deprives us of being able to see the wood from the trees. We cannot even navigate as individuals anymore because this ideology is so pernicious, is so psychologically corrupt that it has effectively instilled what I would describe as a kind of hybridized borderline personality disorder where the identity, uh, the self-image, um, is used to project and to dictate uh, uh, reality to people from a subjective point of view, that, that, that someone as a victim can say, well, from my point of view, this is what I think is happening. And that becomes holy writ, that becomes the truth that lived experience becomes somehow uh, canonical. There's no mediating um, common uh, uh, objective standard or, or moral metric which can be used to bring people into the same paradigm, into the same space, because non-racialism has, has already been sort of discarded. Uh, uh, the, the, the premises have already been... Uh, laid down uh, that, that, you know, the kind of the natural evolution of this toxic ideology is, is somewhat inescapable. And, and so we have a new form of racism, which thinks of itself as a fighter against racism, you know. Um, uh, but, but anyway, I mean, I was trying to also make the argument that, that this is why uh, so many people who have been, let's say, inducted into this culture, this disgusting um, so-called anti-racist culture and, and identity politics, and why effectively they are intolerable um, to be subjected to. You know, they, they become um, morally deficient souls, as it were. You know, these are people who are always going to cause trouble for others because they have a special power which meritocracy um, crumbles uh, uh, before. And so, you know, these are people who can choose to subjectively uh, invent a new form of racism and a new form of, of uh, uh, you know, essentially racism is compensated, you know, the, the accusation and the blanket accusations of systemic racism is compensated uh, to them by them being able to selectively engineer reality from their perspective. And all they have to say is, well, my theory and my interpretation as to the intentions of everyone here and impugning the intentions of everyone here, that, that um, as being a party to some kind of systemic oppression, uh, that is my natural role in this new ideological narrative. And when you give people that kind of unilateral power to dictate reality, um, 
all under the, the guise that they are protecting their self-esteem, which is a very fragile thing and which is hinged on this kind of ideological vampirism. Um, You've, you've got a recipe for a kind of uh, superficial morality and disingenuousness, which uh, is quite frankly, is just too poisonous to support uh, authentic relations. But it also means that people never cultivate trust in a, in a properly mature, they'll never develop the faculty of trust because they will trust their racism instead. They, they will trust their, um, and, and, and they will know that, uh, you know, you meet enough of these people and uh, they are a blight and, and they, they will set us back and they have set us back um, probably a generation. I mean, these people, I, I think, might also be incapable of um, rehabilitation. I mean, well, if, if they are capable of rehabilitation, we need to get everything else right, essentially. Uh, we need to rehabilitate um, the standard of, 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 of non-racialism and we need to have it taught and articulated but instead its antithesis is um, proclaimed and uh, uh, educated about so we essentially are um, are at the moment sort of doing this to ourselves we're, we're propagating the poison we're, we're spreading the problem um, and I mean, this is why uh, sort of the writings on the wall, um, but it's also why we have such a toxic uh, uh, political, you know, because I mean, how, how would the politicians allow schools to be taught that that uh, real non-racialism, which would effectively undermine the ANC's grip on power and uh, essentially uh, debunk the, the toxic politics of, for example, the EFF? Um, Not to mention the fact that so many academics have completely fallen in this, uh, you know, I mean, they, they propagate this anti-constitutional um, morality. Uh, they undermine the, the founding constitutional values and, and they do so with public money. Uh, You know, when when these race and gender studies, which are frankly no different in quality in their philosophical outlook than Aryan studies, like literally, it is exactly comparable. You know, all you do is you, you replace the idea of genetic superiority with the idea of moral superiority, which is inherited from history and which has a kind of historical mythology that... Uh, um, entrenches and bestows this kind of moral pur purity which just gets attributed to people in a categorical way i mean this is this is just racialism in another form that has adopted and corrupted the language of morality um so this is the mess that we are in uh And sadly, the South African Human Rights Commission uh, has helped us I'm being sarcastic, but it has has uh, has facilitated our arrival at this bleak uh, destination. And, and no doubt their army of psychologists with their lies, lies, and statistics and, and moral, morally contrived. Uh, anyway. 